So let me share my screen for you guys. You should be able to see it now. Let me know if you don't see it, but I just went to new. I'm gonna have my preset as 2D. So all my stuff's gonna be in 2D this class. I just named the test project and give it a location. You can have like presets for what you want to do on it, like a preset template. Um, if you're gonna make a 2D game, then make sure it's 2D because if you don't have 2D selected, then when you start importing art and stuff, it'll automatically save it as textures if it's 3D, and that means you have to go in and change all the texture types to, to sprites, and that's just a pain to do. So if you're doing 2D, make sure you have 2D selected. So let me start this right now. It might take a minute to load. What's up? Selected, uh, a project. How do you know if it's 2D or 3D? Like, I already have one selected, but I'm not sure if it's 2D or 3D. If you drag in a sprite, um, and it imports it, like if you drag it into the project window, and it imports it, if it's a texture, then it's probably a 3D project. And I think by default, it's usually a 3D project. Um, there's ways to get around that. I think you might be able to, you, you might be able to change the the um, project settings in the editor. I'll look at that real quick after this. And you might, you might be able to change what it imports as. It's also editor scripts that you can do, but that's more complicated. This will take a minute to load, so just hang out for a minute. Is anybody thinking about messing around with 3D stuff? Was it mostly going to be 2D games? My group might think of doing it, it just depends on if we're going to have time to do it. Gotcha. Because if you don't have a 3D artist, then it's really hard to like get everything you need. Mm -hmm. You have to actually have find the asset. The game Octopath Traveler? Yes. They do something where it's like, the character and everything's 2D, but they have like the visual effects on a 3D plane, which I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, they have like, sprites attached to, um... 3D objects, basically. Mm -hmm. It's cool. Like yeah. It's cool, though. Mm -hmm. So when you start a new project, you should get a blank thing like this. It starts you off with a sample scene that just has a camera attached to it with an ugly color as the background. I don't like that color. Um... It's just too gray, whatever. So, yeah, it's recorded right now. So, first thing I do when I start a new project is make a bunch of new uh, folders to organize my stuff. So, I'm gonna make a folder for my sprites, make a folder for my prefabs. I have audio right now, but I'll do that anyway. Um, what else do I usually do? Materials, scene, scripts, sprites. Yeah, I think that's about it. Cool. So let's start off with some scripting because we are in game programming. Um, so I just right click, go to create. You can add a new script there. Or you can add a new script by going to the object you want to add it to, and you can go to add component, and you can type in a script name, and it gives you the option to make a new script. You can do it that way too. But I like doing it this way because because it um, if you do it this way, it defaults the script to the assets folder, and then you have to drag in the script to the folder you want it to be in after that. So let me open this up. Feel free to stop me anytime if you have questions, by the way. So, when you make a new script, it has this by default. So, the start function built into Unity is called when an object is first created, and it's only called once. So, this is good for starting, um, for initializing a lot of variables. There's um, a couple ones that are similar to it, like void awake is called before 
start void on enable is called when the object is enabled in the scene. So if this thing is checked, then on enable is checked automatically. Automatically calls it. Um, update is called every frame. So if you want to have something constantly happening in your game or have a constant check for something in your game, you would have it in the update function. So if you're checking for a player's input on WASD or the arrow keys, then you would do the input in here to get to make sure you get every frame. And fixed update does the same thing, except for fixed update is called a little less often than update. And a lot of people, um, a lot of tutorials and stuff recommend to do all of the like physics checks and stuff like that in fixed update, but it's not super important. Um, I'll show you why later on. What's up? So uh, let's say you have a character, um, and uh, like with movement, and uh, let's, like let's say our character's movement and like stats. Would that be in the same script, or would it be in a different script? You can do either way. Some people suggest doing things in a more modular way where you have them in separate scripts, like a player stats script and like a player movement script and then like a weapon script and stuff like that. Okay. For players, I usually set it up all in one thing. So I have like a player controller and then I just have everything saved in there. But that can get a little long. So you might want to be careful about putting it all together in case it gets lost in like 600 lines of code. By the way, it's fine. Personal preference, really. Also, sometimes it depends on if you're working in a group and if you want to um, give different tasks to different people. Like, oh, this guy's going to work on player movement and this guy's going to set up the health and stuff. Then having it in the same script isn't going to work because you'll be working on the same script and you'll have conflict immediately. So it just depends on your current project, really. Um, so yeah, there's stuff like fixed update, there's late update. Um, we're just going to worry about regular update right now. And this doesn't matter right now. I'm going to keep awake because I trust awake more than start because it's called, um, immediately and only once when a thing is spawned. So let's see. Okay. So here are some example variables. Um, obviously, you can have strings, you can have integers, you can have floating point numbers, and when you save your script, first you have to attach it to a game object in the scene to actually see it do anything. So we're just going to create a sprite. Don't have any sprites yet. Let me let me drag in the empty like wall sprite so we can actually see our player move. So again, when you drag in a sprite, if it's a sprite over here, that means you have a 2D project. If it's a 3D project, it'll save it as I think a normal map or default. But you can't add those to this like you would normally. So you have to change those if it's um, not imported right. So I'm gonna just rename my thing player. It has a wall on it now, I'm gonna make it uh, blue so we can actually see and tell the difference between that and enemies. And we're gonna add this script to it. So you can do that by dragging it onto the player or you can do it by doing add component and typing in the script name, so example script or you can just drag it onto the inspector view down here. So you can see our public variables are showing up immediately. And you can see how you can change them by just typing them in or dragging over. So obviously integers and floats, you know, whole numbers, not whole numbers, easy. Um, and we're making these public so we can see them and other scripts can reference them if you need to. So if you have like player health and you want to take away from player health, I don't know why this thing is here, then 
you would get a reference to the example script and then just do example script dot integer or some float and then subtract from it when you need to. Sometimes you wouldn't want that because um, say you don't want somebody to be able to edit their variables directly. You would make them private or you would hide them in the inspector so people can't mess with them. So if I do private some other float, sorry, I need to type. When you save it, it's not going to show up in the inspector because it's private, but it's still there. And we can still reference it in here, but we can't reference it in anywhere else. But some other common types that we need to know are game object. Transform is also helpful. Hmm. So if we add, if we look at those directly, make another game object so we get a reference to it. Put it over here. Hmm. Sprite renderer to it so we can see it. I'm going to just call it enemy, even though it's not going to do anything right now. But we can get a reference to it over here by dragging it in. Same thing for the transform. If we want to have, like, if we want the camera to follow the player, we can get a reference to the transform. And that transform um, references this component right here the x position, the y position, the z position, and then the rotation and scale of the object that we're referencing the transform to. So I don't know if we need that for anything right now, but let's leave it right there. If you click on it, it'll show what object you're currently referencing. These also work for prefabs. So if you want to spawn something, like spawn an enemy, then you drag it into the prefab folder. You can get a reference to it dragging it in over here, and this is going to spawn this thing now, which is different from this thing. It's an actual scene. So, let's see. Mm. Also have booleans, you can have vector threes. For rotation, you can have a quaternion, which is similar to a vector three. It's got the X, Y, and Z component, but it's for rotation instead of position. Um, something helpful for this one. Let's say you want a number, but you don't want them to edit the. But you want. So you want to set up a like a float, but you don't want it to be like have like an infinite range. And you want somebody to be able to edit it. So we give this a range of like one to like twenty five. You just put this right above the float you want it to reference, and then you'll see in the inspector, when you click on it, it shows a little draggable bar now. That's between those two values that you set up in the script. So that's pretty handy. So, let's start by getting player input. So Unity has a built-in input system. You go to the edit, you go to project settings, input manager. So all of these you can reference to set up different um, key inputs, whether it's WASD or like the space bar or it's controller input or so on. So if you click on one of them to drag it down, so horizontal the horizontal axis references left and right and A and D. So if you're moving left and right, then you want to reference these ones. Or you can change it if you don't like it. You can just type in, like, I don't want this to be A, I want this to be F. Or something weird. So, I'm going to check for player input right now. Um, so I'm going to save this to a variable called input. I'm going to check it every frame. So you're going to reference input dot get axis. 
and you have to type in the string name. So we're trying to get horizontal as the first one. Second one, we want to get input dot get axis vertical. And I'm going to name um, a speed variable so we don't move too fast. So let's check for if the input on the x is not equal to zero. So if we're pushing A, D, or left or right arrows, we're going to change the transform dot position plus equals new vector three. Oh, mm. let's do. Yeah. Oh, because it's. Yes, it is plus equals. Sorry, the mic's a little quiet. Back real quick. But to that right, times speed. Yeah, so if we're moving. Oh, sorry. Times input.x. So if we're pushing left or right, we're going to push it to the right if input x is greater than 0. If it's less than 0, it's going to push it to the left. This, we're not checking. What's up? I have a question. Um, so say instead of putting the speed as a float, you put it as an integer. Is there a moment it basically is going to become choppy because you're only doing your whole numbers? Yeah, it'll become a little choppy because it's not doing it incrementally. Yeah, it's like it's going like one, two instead of like one, one, two, or anything. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. There's ways we can um, work around that. And I'm going to actually use some of Unity's stuff in a minute to um, make the physics better. Because right now we're just pushing things to the right. It's not going to check for collisions at all. So if we put a wall up, it'll just go through the wall. Gotcha. So right now let's just set the speed to like 0.1. I think it's going to be too fast anyway. Let's see. Yeah, so I think moving left and right, but let's add some collisions to this. So we're going to add a collider 2D to our box, and then it automatically um, sets the bounds if you have a sprite on it. If you don't, it'll just try to guess what the size is going to be. I'm going to make another sprite. I'm going to call it wall. I'm going to put the wall sprite there. I'm going to make it black. I'm going to make it bigger. If you want, you can go to this little part up here. This one. You can just drag it. And it collided to that one. Automatically picks the size right. So if we have actually, if we have actual physics from Unity, then these shouldn't go into each other. But we haven't set that up yet. So let's do that right now. So I'm going to add a rigid body 2D, which checks for collisions in here. And before I mess with that, I'm going to change the gravity scale to 0 so it doesn't fall down infinitely. And I think it'll still go through it. Oh, yeah. So if it goes fast enough, it'll still go through it because it's not adding speed incrementally and it's not um, pushing the rigid body. It's pushing the transform itself. So we're going to go back in here. I'm going to get a reference to the rigid body. So you're going to say rigid body 2D. And then in our wake event, we're going to find that reference. So we're going to say bod equals get component. Get component just tries to find this component on whatever object we're referencing. So if you just say get component, it's the one that's calling. It's the script that's calling that get component reference. If it's in like enemy, it'll call it for the enemy and try to find it in there. So because it's on the player, we just have to say get component rigid body 2D. 
Now that we have that, we're going to do this instead. So instead of adding to the position, we're going to do widget body dot add force. We're going to do open parentheses and close parentheses. So this should work better. I'm going to leave that for a second if anybody needs to type it. Cool. So this should probably need to be bigger now. Let's see what it does. Yeah, it's moving really slowly. And you'll notice it won't it won't like stop itself. It won't have like friction yet. We want to add that. We're gonna to go to the widget bodies linear drag, and we get to change it to like seven or something. We can up the speed to like fifty. That might be too much though. Let's see. Yep. So it's gonna stop on the wall. We can do the same thing with the y axis. We'll just copy paste and we'll say input dot y. Is not equal to zero, you're going to do vector three dot up. It's going to be vector two actually, it just have to be three now. Times input dot y. And it should move the thing up and down and left and right. So is up and right already built into Unity as like yes. the directional arrows? Okay. Yep. Well, you mean the inputs or you mean the this, the vector two? So, like. So you don't have to make like right is equal to like the basically I'm saying is it like the the up up arrows side arrows are already built into Unity and you just like just call them whenever you get an input. It, it's set up by default in the input manager. So the input already has horizontal and vertical and all these other ones that we can use. So say you're checking for somebody jumping, you have a jump button already built in. So you can do input dot get axis get axis jump. So we're just calling horizontal and vertical because they're already set up and they already define left, right, and up and down. And we can add more too. So if you want extra buttons, you can add those. You can just increase the size by one. And I think it duplicates the the very last option. And then you can just change that very last option to be what you want. Gotcha. And it also it's also cool because it comes in it's horizontal and there's vertical, but there's also the same named ones, but these ones take in controller input instead. So down here it says type and it says joystick axis. So if you plug in a controller and you have this code in there, it should just do controller inputs automatically. So that's pretty cool. So it basically has like uh, already controller support, so you have to code Yeah. The only problem with controller support that I've had so if you have more than one person playing on a controller, it's a pain to get the right controller with the right input. Because I think the first controller, it saves as input one or joystick one. But the ones after that, they're all random. Like I had two or three controls plugged in, but they were like shuffled every time that I plugged them back in. So I wouldn't be able to tell which player was doing what. So that was, that's fun. Um, so we're going to do one more thing to this to make it more... Um, um, I don't know, friendly. Let's see, seven, eight, nine. I'm going to zoom this camera way out. And my dude's moving kind of crazy fast still. Oh, see, he kind of moved already through it. Oh, maybe he didn't. Also, that's a cool thing, too. So if he rotates like that, you can just go to the widget body, and you can do constraints, and you can do freeze rotation, so it doesn't go crazy when you collide with anything. Also, we're going to go to here again. And for the x and y, we're just going to multiply by time dot delta time, which basically makes it so that if there's any lag in your game or any frame drops, you don't just fly through walls. So it'll mean this is updating at a, at a constant frame rate. So if you have any lag, it won't do that. It won't um, go through things or act weird. But because of that, we have to up the speed to like 500 maybe. That might be too slow even. Yeah, too slow. Um, 
1500. Mm. Still not great, but. So is it like using oh. time as a metric? Basically? That's why you have to put the speed so high? Because it's. Yeah. Like real over time. Okay. It's using delta time, and it. Delta time, it says it um, measures the time in seconds since the last frame. So it's like 0 0.01, 0 0.001, and it keeps incrementing. So it keeps checking what the last frame was. So if there's lag, then it'll um, adjust accordingly and not send you flying all at once. So if there's lag on this game, it won't change it at all, how I move. The game might lag, but you won't see the player go from here to way over here in half a second. He'll still be right here because it hasn't updated since last frame. So, but yes, yeah, we don't go through walls now. Um, and we have player input. Um, let's do camera follow. So I'm going to make a new script. I'm going to call it camera controller. Oh, good, good name. Good typo. Camera controller. I'm going to rename this so it actually. Camera controller. So we're going to say wide awake. We're going to need a reference to a transform. I'm going to call it target. We're going to have. Um, Leave that alone for a minute. So we're gonna do. Let's just do update actually. If I can type anything, please. So we're gonna do um, transform dot position equals new vector three. We're gonna do target dot position dot X target dot position dot y and the camera has to be on something like negative ten on the Z. So otherwise you won't be able to see anything if they're on the same um if they're both have, if they're on the same Z section. You see this one's negative ten, this one's zero, this one's something close to zero. If it's on the same thing, you won't be able to see anything. If you put it to zero, you can't see. If you put this to like negative 11, you can't see it either. So make sure if you're doing 2D, you want to have all your stuff be um, closer to zero and keep your camera on like negative 10 or something. But we have a reference to a target and we're changing our position of the camera to be the target's X, the target's Y, and negative 10 on the Z. So we'll just add this to the camera, and we can drag in the player if we want, right there, and it should update automatically. You can also do this by just dragging the camera onto the player, and that sets the parent of the camera to be the player. So the camera is a child of the player now, and it follows the same movements and everything. But it doesn't look very nice. It's just kind of moving the same speed. We want it to kind of gradually change its position to that. So I'm going to change that right now to do that. So we have this lerp speed variable. And we're going to do something with mathf. Uh, tree site vector vector 3 dot lerp so lerp means linear interpolation I think yeah linearly interpolates between two points so basically we're gonna say go from this point to this point over a certain amount of time so I'm not gonna change it all at once we're gonna change it gradually so it doesn't look as um, fixed I guess that's the right word transform dot position to 
So we go from this position to this position by this amount. Now I think I think this is where you want to get um, fixed update instead of regular update because it'll look kind of choppy. So we're going to make this like 15 or something. Oh, I disabled it. That's why. Yeah, so see how it's kind of choppy. It's updating at a rate that um, I think it's updating the same time that the player is updating. So let's do fixed update and we're going to change delta time to fixed delta time. And it should fix it, hopefully. Yep, looks better. And we can change this to be like a lower number. Let's see, it looks kind of nicer. But if it's too low, it won't actually follow right or completely. And if it's too high, it'll be just like the other, just like parenting it. So I think 15 is a nice number. Or 10 even. Like I said last time, if you're playing the game and you're editing stuff, when you click out of it, it's going to revert it back. So make sure you know what you're editing so you can change it back when you exit the editor. So yeah, that's player movements, collision, and input, and camera follow. Any questions so far? Still have like 40 minutes. Um, can go over instantiation, I guess. Okay, let's do that then. I'm going to import something else so I don't have the same box every time. I'm going to do a circle this time. I'm going to drag in a circle sprite. Oh, also, I'm going to change these, their uh, filter mode to point instead of bilinear. Because point, if you're doing pixel art, you need to do point because otherwise it'll try to do anti aliasing, which makes pixel art look ugly. So, not fun. So, I'm going to drag this into the scene. The top of the player, so. And I'm gonna, um, we can do some more on collisions actually. Um, let's see, add a rigid body to that, add a B0, add a circle collider. I'm gonna uh, have the player shoot these out. So I'm gonna have it be a trigger collider instead of a regular collider, which means that, um, It'll go through objects, but they can still detect collisions. I don't want to make it a regular collider because if the player spawns it right here, it'll push the player back because it'll spawn inside of a collider and Unity, Unity doesn't like that. So I have those two. Let's do a ball controller. Just drag it onto it right now. So I'm going to save this as a prefab. So I'm going to get a reference to this in the player. I'm going to check for if I'm pressing the spacebar. 
So instead of get get access, I'm gonna just do get key down. If you want to just hard code in inputs, you can do this too. So you can type in key code dot whatever key you want. So I can do A or D. I can do backspace. I can do I'm gonna do space though for this. Oh whoops. Or you can do um even do get mouse button down. So if you're using this mouse button zero is the left mouse button. Mouse button one is the right mouse. If I'm not sure. I feel like two is the middle mouse, but I'm not sure about that. You, you, you can also get the mouse scroll wheel if you want to do that for something. Um, so I'm going to spawn a ball. So I'm going to do instantiate. Let's just spawn, spawn something into the scene. You want to give it a position. I'm going to do transform.position. Um, it wants a, sorry, it wants a object you want to spawn, then the position, then the rotation. So I'm going to say quaternion.identity. Here we go. Hmm. So the player has a reference to the ball. Once I drag it in there, if I hit space, it should spawn a ball. So let's make it do something. Just make it easy. I'm just going to make it shoot up for now. I'm going to do rigid body. Oh, OK, rigid boy. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm going to give it a float speed. Oh, I think that's it actually. Um, instead of an update, I'm going to do an awake to get the rigid body, and I'm going to do an on enable. To void on enable. I'm gonna just say bod dot add force. Similar to what we did last time, I'm just gonna do vector two dot up times speed. I'm not gonna do times delta time on this one because on enable is only called once. And um I think the problem with um the player needs to have it is because you're checking every frame for their inputs. But if you add force just the one time, I think Unity should automatically be checking for the walls and stuff then. So I think it should be fine. Not sure. So we're going to go back here. We're going to edit the prefab. If you want to edit a prefab, you just double click on it in the project view. I think you can also do it in the actual scene. Oh no, you cannot. Okay. So if I edit it in here, it's not going to save over to the prefab unless I um, apply the changes. So let me do that so I, can, so I can show you guys. So if I edit the speed right here and I do it to like 10, then it saves it to all the instances that have it. So over here it should have 10. But if I change it here to 100, it's not going to save it to the prefab. It's still 10. If I want to um, apply those changes to the prefab, I want to go up here to override, and I want to override all. And then here we have saved the changes to the ball. I think it's still way too fast. This is like 25. So, um, do we have whatever we need? Rigid body, circle collider. Yeah, I think we're good. Way too slow, Jesus.
So yeah, cool. And if you want to check for collisions, let me make a let me make a wall up here. Check for that. So I'm gonna just move this, and I'm gonna rotate it 90 degrees. I'm gonna give it a tag. So you go to tag up here, add tag, and add a wall tag. So it has the wall tag now. I'm going to go up to here, make a new function. If you do um, void on trigger enter 2D, and it should auto complete for you. So this is whenever a collider with the trigger checked on it, whenever this collider enters a, 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 another collider. So I'm going to say if collision dot compare tag, it has the wall tag. Oh, I don't have parentheses on everything. Sorry. So if you're hitting a wall, then you're going to disable it. And if you want to reference the game object that's attached to the script, you just do um, lowercase g on game object, uppercase o. So it means this object is attached to it. Component is always attached to a game object. Yep. So if it's a wall, it'll destroy it. So back to the player, but it destroys itself when it hits a wall. I don't know if anybody's following along and trying to do this with me. Um, but if you have any problem getting it working, let me know. Uh, let's see. I'm going to rename this example script to player player controller, so I know what it is actually. Space bar. Can try to do some UI too, if you guys want. Give the player some health. Okay then. Also, um, I have like 25 minutes left. Um, I'm going to do this real quick, and then I'm going to go over uh, starting a GitHub. So if you already have your project, and or if you set up, if you start your project, then you can add your teammates to it. Um, let's see. So I can add this project to a repository and then show you guys it that way. So let's see, I have a... Oh. So I'm going to have a max health and a current health. And when the player spawns, I'm going to do HP equals max HP. I'm going to make this private, actually, so nothing can edit it. So let's see. What's damage to the player when he gets hit, um, when he hits the enemy? If collision dot game object dot compare tag I'm 
there are subtle differences between on trigger enter 2D and on collision enter 2D. It's on trigger enter 2D has a reference to a collider 2D, whereas on collision enter 2D has a reference to a collision 2D, which are two different things. Because a collision can reference a tag, but the collision the collider can reference a tag, but the collision has to go collision dot game object dot compare tag. Slightly different. So if you ever get an error um, on either on collision or on trigger, you might have to change this thing right here. So keep that in mind. It's happened a lot. So if you hit the enemy, then HP minus minus subtract from your health. I'm gonna make this. Um, Actually, if you have a private field that you want to see in the inspector, you can do the little brackets and you can do serialize field right here. And then it should show up, but it should still be private. So right here I have the player. And yep, so HP shows up even though it's private. Let's say max HP is like 100. And let's give the enemy an enemy tag so it knows it's getting hit. I'm going to go to the prefab actually add the tag to the enemy and you can also add layers to it to make sure things don't hit each other um, like there's a whole like um, list of things on here if you go to physics 2d in the project settings you see this whole like matrix as you add different layers it'll make this matrix a lot bigger so you can make it so bullets don't hit other bullets you can make it so um, you can make tags for like enemy bullets and make them not hit the enemy. There's a bunch of stuff you can do with it that um, you don't need to. You can work around stuff like that, but just keep that in mind. So the enemy has an enemy tag, and I'm going to look at the player right now. Oh, shoot. You can make different layers, yeah. Yeah, you can do add layer and you can add all these layers. The problem with it is there's a preset amount, there's like a max amount of layers you can have, and also a max amount of tags you can have. Um, I don't think it'll tell you the max um, on here, but I think there's like 30 or 50 or something like that. Let me see. Unity max number of tags. The number of tags you can have is 10,001. So you can have a lot of tags, but um, you don't want to rely on tags for everything. So, like, um, in my example games, I had, like, 10 or 12 tags that I used between different games. So, like, the player tag was always there. Enemy tags were the same. And I could just reuse different tags for different things if I needed to. So, it's also inheritance on stuff, so you can have less tags for that. Um, but I'll show that way later in the class, probably. Not even sure now because um, I was supposed to do this stuff like next week, so I'm going way ahead of schedule. So I'll probably show a lot more advanced stuff um, in like a month or so, if I can. We'll see. Um, so this enemy needs to have a collider, and if you're still not getting a collision, you probably have to add a rigid body to the object. Let me see if that actually hurt the player. Okay, yeah, he got hurt. So he's losing one health every time he hits the enemy. I want to make that more extreme. So let's do um, minus equals 15 or something. I want to make that into a UI object. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to make a UI. I'm going to make an image. And don't worry about this thing. I'm just gonna go to lay uh, to um, layers. Somehow I can do this to not view the the UI. There we go. So you click layers, go down to UI, and you can click that little button to not view the UI in the scene view. If we go to the game view, and we can change image position I'm just gonna put it like top left of the screen so if you click on the little button up here 
you can hold alt and click on the top left icon right there that anchors it to that position I'm gonna just change it to be like 500 to like 25 sorry like 300 to like 25 put it over by 100 uh, 200 negative 50 and to so I want this health bar to go down according to what my health is so I'm gonna add a sprite to it it's gonna be a wall I'm gonna change its image type to filled change its fill method to horizontal and then if I drag this little bar it'll go up and down I'll also show you guys how to do um like um hearts like Zelda style health although I'll do whole hearts instead of um, parts of a sprite that's what I did for the examples too so should be good so I'm gonna go to the script we have to do using unity engine.ui up at the top there I'm gonna get a reference to the image you say public image health bar and then an update at the very bottom I'm gonna say health bar dot fill amount equals and I'm gonna say um, HP over max HP so health bar dot fill amount equals HP over max HP I'm gonna using the UI and image health bar right there I go back here go to the player can drag in the reference right there and it should update as we get hurt it's nice to have like a little background so I'm gonna if you go to the inspector and you click on a thing and you hit control D you can duplicate it so I'm gonna put it above that and I'm gonna make it black looks a little nicer But yeah, um, some basic UI. I'll do some more advanced UI next time where you can make buttons do stuff. Um, but I think I'll do GitHub right now and then I'll finish with that. Any questions on this before I quit out of it? No? Cool. I'm gonna quit out of that one. Quit out of that. I'm gonna do GitHub Desktop. I recommend you get you get GitHub Desktop. I'm gonna add make a new repository. Um, what did I name this project? Test project. Um, test project. Yeah. So I'm gonna call this test project. It has to be the same name as your actual project folder and then I'm gonna find it I'm gonna do documents I'm gonna do test project select that folder I'm gonna do git ignore for unity and then I'm gonna create a repository not now so then you should see if you go to your documents wherever your game is saved you go to that in this same folder you should have a git attributes and a git ignore if you have this then you can push it to github if you don't have these two in the same folder as this stuff it won't push all of these assets to it make sure you have those so i'm gonna publish to github i keep it i'm not gonna keep it private let's see what it does and it's taking a minute because it actually has stuff to push if it takes like half a second, then you might not have anything in your thing. So let me see over here. I'm going to do um, test project. Yeah, so if I show you over here, I have test project, and it has all this stuff there still. So I can go to assets. I can see the prefabs that we just made. I can see the scripts that we just made. Look on that. You can see all the, all the code in there too. If you want to add your... Um, team members to that you go to settings you go to manage access you enter a password I don't think it's gonna show my password but yeah then you do invite a collaborator and you just type in their name and then add them that way 
And then if you are added to a project that your classmates added you to, let me see. Let's see. Yeah, so this is a game that I did a while ago that I was added to. If I want to copy it to my own system, you can go to code and mine says open with github desktop so that's the most that's the easiest way to do it i think if you download it and do it on your own system there might be more stuff you have to do but get the get your desktop is the easiest way it'll just open it right here and i can just copy everything to here and then it'll show up in this little drop down menu so you should be able to access it but if you guys are working on the same project make sure you guys have different scenes if you edit the same scene and there's conflicts, if there's one conflict in the same scene, then it'll break the whole scene. Um, if you're working on the same script, you'll have to merge in different ways on that. Um, I can help you guys with, well, minor conflicts if you want to just merge everything together. But um, I haven't done, I haven't really dealt with like editing one part and saving another part. Like if one teammate works on one thing, another works on another thing, and you want to save one on one side and get the other with the other. I haven't done too much of that, but Question. what's up? Is the Unity Clap, is it not a repository, but directly into the system itself for like the changes you make, or is there a repository for Unity Collab? It's saved, it's saved onto Unity itself. I'm not sure where exactly it saves it to. Um, like I have a project somewhere down here that's using Unity Collab, this one. Let's see if it loads. Um, the only problem with Unity Collab is, like I said last time, I worked on it, I worked with it for a whole semester, and the last like four days before the final, everything like stopped pushing. L like my teammates would add stuff to the game, but I wouldn't get what they added to the game. So I had to add it myself, and then they wouldn't get it when I pushed it. So I don't know why it broke at the last second, but it did. GitHub is more annoying to mess with, but it doesn't do stuff like that. So, and uh, Unity Collab only works with three people at a time. So, yeah, you have to pay for more than three people, which is also a pain. But you know, so it's checking for changes over here in the Unity Collab. This is this is the game um, we made last semester, me and my group, for game design. Yeah, so there's no changes left over here, so it says nothing over here. If I change something and save it, then it'll say that's what you saved, that's what you changed. Do you want to push it? And you'll just add a summary and you can publish it. Undo that, undo that save. You can stash your changes. Um, discard changes, yep. Yep, and now we're good. So, and sometimes um, if you're not open on this for a while, like the project's open, but you haven't used it for a while, like you close out of it like that, then if you open it back up, it might say it, um, this doesn't load. It says there's no ID yet. You might have to close and reopen the, the project to get it going again. But yeah, you can do that too if you guys want. It just might be a little more of a pain to get stuff working at the last minute. So. Yeah, I think I'm gonna so, end it there. No would, more questions. Would you say that for code, mostly put it up to, uh, to GitHub? I recommend yeah. GitHub, yes. So do you think we should put everything to GitHub or just put like our assets or like our audio on Google Drive and then go on GitHub or just everything on GitHub? You can put the you can put the audio into Unity, into the Unity project and then put that on the GitHub. Okay. So you can save everything to the Unity project and then you can push the Unity project to GitHub. Okay. Yeah, that's what I recommend. I haven't used like Git Kraken or uh, Git Bash before. I just use GitHub Desktop because that's what I've always, that's what I use first, and that's what always worked for me. So, but yeah. And then um, would would the GitHub perhaps because you haven't mentioned you just mentioned about like putting in screenshots for the code, but would it somehow be beneficial to like share a GitHub? Of our projects and all our project courses, or do you just want to... That's what um, it was Turner's idea to do the product, the progress reports, 
So he just wants the um, he wants the description and the the screenshots. If you want to put your code, that's perfectly fine too. But um, he doesn't require it. So if you don't want to, you don't have to. Um, also, one thing that might be helpful is oh, not Unreal, no, <laughs> wrong engine. <laughs> Shit, that's gonna take a while to load. Um, let me open this real quick. Yes, I did. Yes. So if you have something um, that you worked on for a while, but you haven't pushed in a long time, and you're worried about it breaking, or one, um, if you're worried about it breaking when you push it, or if you're worried about a classmate breaking something before you get a mix them together, then you can also go to the project tab and you can right click and you can do export package. And you can export your stuff that you have right now as a Unity package. And if it breaks, you can drag in the package to the to the um, new version, and it'll upload everything to that. So if you're really worried about everything breaking, you can save it as a package, and then you can just give the package to your teammate. So like a save point, sort of. Yes, yes. So this is how you import assets to, to Unity. Like, I have all these assets. If I want to, I can just drag any of them in here, and it'll upload everything that they've saved on here. So packages are very helpful, especially if you're going to... If you're like panicking, you're like, I don't know if it's going to work or if this thing's going to break everything or if you don't like your teammate and you think they're going to break stuff. So, you know. But yeah. Any more questions is fine. I'm going to hang out for a little bit. But that's you, the class. It's not exactly about the project. So um, I was wondering, do you think it's a good idea for, um, for the projects that might really have something to project term to be public on GitHub or free You can make them public. Um, mine are always public anyway. I don't see a point in making them private, really. Um, unless you're going to like monetize your game, I don't see a point in making them private. No. I mean, if, if you're going to sell your game, that's a different thing, but like... If you're just making example projects or something per, for a portfolio, then that's probably fine. Like, I upload my games to a website called itch.io, and anybody can play them here. So at the end, I'll show you how to make builds of your games, so you can upload all your games there, or wherever you want. You can put them on Google Drive or whatever. But, um, yeah, having them all in one place where people can play them is... I, I think it's better than having them on GitHub, but you can link both in a portfolio. The H.io, you have to pay for that, or is it like free? Nope, it's like Steam, but free, and you can pick your prices. So, yep. These are all my games. Where is the um, lecture recordings going to be posted? I'll link them in the announcements page, but they're on my YouTube page. I'm making them um, unlisted videos because I'm going to make actual like tutorial videos eventually. Um, and I'm sure you guys don't want your voices in random ass videos from some random dude anyway. And I get off topic a bunch. So, but yeah, I'll link them on, um, on discord once they're uploaded. Like this one took like two hours or so to actually process or the, the last one did. So it takes a little bit of time, but yeah, should be good. I think I'm going to stop recording now and then I can start uploading it though soon.